All right. Oh, I kind of hate it. It's this is a, a good bad thing. We're gonna read John 21, which is wonderful. But now we're finishing up the book of John. And I wish we could stay in it for a long, long, long time. But today we're finishing up the book of John together. So John 21. It says later. Now, of course, right after what we just did in ch chapter 20. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee, and this is how it happened. It says several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter was there, Thomas, whose nickname Didymus, or the twin, Nathaniel from Canaan, Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two other disciples. So not all of them, but there's maybe six, it looks like, something like that. And so it says, Simon Peter said, I'm going to go fishing. And so they all said, well, we'll come too. Nothing wrong with going fishing. You know, they were fishermen by trade. Of course, he shouldn't go back to the business of fishing. He needed to be fishing for men. But so they go fishing. We don't want to make a big deal out of that. And so it says, we'll come too, they said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. Ooh, Jesus is about to do something powerful. So they caught nothing all night long. At dawn, Jesus was standing there on the beach. But the disciples couldn't see who he was. They didn't recognize him. They didn't realize it was him. Now, maybe again, like Mary outside the tomb, maybe his, his look was a little different, or maybe they were just far enough away from him. You know, they're in the boat. He's on the shore. They couldn't quite see him clearly enough to know it was him. And it says, he called out fellows or friends. Have you caught any fish? No, they replied. And then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. Well, it says, so they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. They weren't strong enough to pull it in. It says, and then the disciple that Jesus loved, that's again John, said to Peter, it's the Lord, it's Jesus. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic. See, he'd already appeared to him a couple of times, and, but not every day, you know, sometimes it was more than a week, you know, it was a later, for 40 days he was appearing to them a few times here and there. And here he is again, so they're all excited. And it says, so Peter heard that it was the Lord, and he put on his tunic because he had stripped down to work. Now, I don't know if he was completely naked, I don't know what the culture was at that time. Maybe he had some kind of undergarment on, some little shorts or something. But he, for whatever reason, put on his tunic and jumped into the water, and he headed to the shore. The others stayed with the boat, and they pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were, they were only about 100 yards from the shore. So here they are, about 100 yards. That's actually quite a ways, the length of a football field from the shore. No wonder they couldn't recognize it was Jesus when they first saw him out there. And, uh, and so it says they stayed in the boat and they pulled the loaded net to the shore. In other words, they didn't try to get that net onto the boat. They couldn't lift it up, but they could drag it to shore. They are about 100 yards away from the shore. And it says when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire. Now wait, they're bringing a big load of fish, but Jesus is already cooking fish. How many of y'all know that when you're trying to get your bills all together, God's already got all the resources? I've seen the Lord so many times brings in finances from places I would have never expected them to come. Had no idea they could have come that way, but God's got everything you need in heaven. Amen? And when we tithe, I've always been, thank God, through the grace of God, I've always been a faithful tither now for 40 years. Even when I had next to nothing, you know, somebody taught me when I was a very young Christian the importance of tithing. And when you do that, you're sowing seeds. You're planting seeds for a crop you're going to reap later on. And then you, when you give to the poor, you know, God's always given me a heart. You know, I give him the thanks for that. I've always had a heart to help the poor. And the Bible says when you help the poor, you lend to God, and God will repay you at the perfect time. Well, how can God repay you, and how can God bless you, unless he's got all this stuff? Friend, God, everything you need, God's got it, and he can get it to you. That's, that's for sure. He just wants to make sure that you're faithful with it once he gives it to you. Amen. That you do godly things with what he gives you. And so they're out here pulling, you know, they fished all night, didn't catch any fish. Jesus says, hey, go over here, you're going to catch some. And they caught so many, they couldn't even lift them up on the boat. The net was so heavy. And now they go, they drag all the fish to shore. And here's Jesus, he's already got fish. He's already got breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire. And he had some bread cooking. And so Jesus said, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore, and there were 153 large fish, and yet the net had not torn. And apparently that was somewhat of a miracle even in that, that they had so many, 153 
large, large fish, and yet the net had not torn. Verse 12, Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? And so obviously his appearance was changed somehow. He still obviously looked like a man, but he didn't look like Jesus that they had known on the earth. Because here they are now, they're face to face with him. They'd lived with him for three years, traveled around everywhere with him, and yet they looked at him, they knew it was him, but they weren't positive enough to dare to ask him, Who are you? Yet they knew it was the Lord. Verse 13, Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he'd been raised from the dead. Verse 15, After Jesus, or excuse me, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, this is one of the sweetest stories and most penetrating stories in the Bible right here. It says, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now he just says more than these, and so the scholars will argue, do you, mean, do you love me more than these other people? Or do you love me more than these fish? You know, go figure. We don't know. But we know that Jesus was saying, do you love me more than anything else in this world? That's what he's really asking. Do you love me the most, more than yourself, more than your own life? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I did take you know, several years of Greek, and I can sit down with the Greek New Testament, and I can pretty much read it. You know? But I also know enough to read Greek dictionaries and read what all the different theologians and commentators have written. And there's a lot of discussion about this passage, because what happens is Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, uh, you know that I love you. Well, Peter uses a different word than the word that Jesus used. Peter, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And he uses the word agape. And agape is that word about sacrificial, all-encompassing love, like love over the, over the moon. You know, I, do you love me, love me, love me? The kind of love that God has for us. And, G, and Peter says back to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But Peter's not bold enough to use the word that Jesus used. He doesn't say, yes, I love you with agape love. He says, yes, Lord, I have phileo. That's brotherly love. You know, let's say kind of like Philadelphia is, is the, brother of, uh, you know, the city of brotherly love, you know, uh, phileo. And, um, and so he says, yes, I love you, Lord. Well, then Jesus says, feed my sheep or feed my lambs. It says, Jesus told him. Verse 16, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me with agape love, that deep self-sacrificial love? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I love you with phileo love. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. You know, so if you really love me, if you put me first, Jesus says, do your job and take care of the, the people that mean so much to me. Take care of all my sheep. Take care of all my little lambs. You know, take care. As a pastor, somebody asked me this week, what does it mean to you to be a pastor? Well, it means that I'm, I'm a shepherd to take care of. My job is to protect and to nurture and to, and to help and to lead and to go out in front and always pay the price to make life easier and better, you know, safer, richer, more meaningful, uh, you know, more godly, to help people know the Lord. And so he says, Peter, go do that for my people. You know, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And then a third time, Jesus asked him, son, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And now Jesus uses the same word Peter's been using. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you have phileo? Do you have brotherly love for me? And it says, Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. Or it says another place, a more literal translation, because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And, and so some people say, well, he was hurt because he asked him three times. But others, those that go down into the Greek meaning, say, no, no, he was hurt because this time he didn't ask me, do you have that all out, you know, head over heels, over the moon kind of love for me. He just, he acquiesced, he, he condescended to that level of love where Peter was at right then. You know, he met Peter where he was at. And friend, Jesus will meet you where you're at. He won't ask more of you than what you have to give. You know, he won't require more of you. He's like a good parent. You know, if, if, whenever my kids, I have three sons, and now they're all bigger than me and stronger than me. And when they were little, though, I would never ask them to carry something that I figured was too heavy for them. You know, I'd give the biggest boy something to carry, and I'd give the next boy something a little bit lighter, the next boy something a little bit lighter, you know, gauged based on what I thought they could do. And here Jesus reaches out to Peter the third time. He says, okay, Peter, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on your side. Do you have phileo for me? And, and Peter says, Lord, you know everything. 
you know that I have filial love for you. See, Peter, God bless him, wasn't going to lie to Jesus. As much as he would have liked to say, yes, Lord, you know I've got this total self-sacrificial love, he knew it hadn't been that many days since that he had stood out around a fire in a courtyard with some Roman soldiers and some temple guards and some little servant girls and denied that he even knew Jesus. And he just wasn't about to say to God, oh, you know, God, that I love you. I've told the Lord many times, Lord, I love you with all my heart. But God, I don't trust in my love. I trust in your love. I know you love me with an unfailing love. I, I don't know that in me I have the kind of love that you require, but Lord, give me that kind of love. Fill me with that kind of love. And so Jesus says, do you love me? And Peter says, no, I love you. And so Jesus says again, feed my sheep. And then Jesus says, I tell you the truth, talking to Peter, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself, you went wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. You see, Peter spent years of his life with his, with his hands in chains and he was led about and taken wherever people wanted to take him. He spent years in prison because of his faith and, uh, and, uh, and uh, refusing to deny his faith. And he says, others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. And then Jesus said this, verse 19, he said this to let Peter know by what kind of death he would glorify God. And then Jesus told him, follow me. He says, Peter, the road ahead of you is going to be rough. When you were young, you did whatever you wanted to. But now you're going to follow me, and it's going to be rough for you. But follow me anyway. Amen? Amen. Verse 20, then Peter turned around, and he saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved. Again, John, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during the supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? By the way, why do I think that's John? Because he was the one that leaned over and they said leaned on Jesus' breast and asked him who's going to betray you at the Last Supper. And the culture of that time says that they were seated at the table from the oldest to the youngest. And John was the youngest, so he would have been the one sitting by Jesus on that side. And so he was known as the disciple that Jesus loved, uh, although he was always too humble to call himself that. Others called him that. And so it says... So Peter turns around and sees John, the one that Jesus leaned over, that leaned over to Jesus during the Last Supper, the one that Jesus loved, and asked the Lord, who will betray you? And Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? Now, I've, I've preached on this message many times. People will a lot of times say, well, I know God wants me to do that. Well, how about somebody else? You know, they lie, and, and they sleep around, and, and they do drugs, and they drink, and they cuss, and all that kind of stuff. And I say, buddy, that's between them and God. You know, if they, you don't know what kind of a penalty they're paying for their sins, but I guarantee you, you know better. And this is between God and you. And you need to do what's right. You need to get that sin out of your life. When I got saved the first few weeks, seemed like every day, God was just showing me things that I was doing that were completely contrary to His will. And I gave up a whole lot of sin in that first couple of weeks. Even then, when I got to Bible school, uh, I, I actually, I mean, it's not something I'm proud of, it, but it, it's something that makes me happy to know that the Lord forgave me and He will forgive you. When I got to Bible school, I was still smoking dope. I didn't know it was wrong. In L.A. in the 70s, everybody I knew did it and, and grew out of the ground. I thought, well, God made it, so I guess it's okay. And I got to Bible school and, and they explained to me that it was illegal and that it was immoral and it was a, a way that I would dull my senses and it would dull my relationship with the Lord and it would even open me up to being receptive to spiritual influences from other, from other directions or maybe I'm not as discerning what kind of spirit I'm getting mixed up in and so it could open the door to demonic things and so when they explained that to me I quit it you know I quit it uh, right away you know and so it's between you and God if everybody else does it you know if they legalize marijuana in Texas I don't care I'm not smoking it I know it's not right it's not God's will it's not God's plan for my life and everybody else can do it but it's between me and God that I'm not going to do it and so Peter says Lord I know you're talking to me this is kind of tough this is kind of a tough talk. You're, you're asking me to do all these things, and you're telling me my life's going to be hard, and you're still telling me to follow you, but what about this guy over here? Well, let's see what Jesus says. Jesus says, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. So in other words, again, it's, it, whatever happens with that other guy, you know, somehow he gets away with doing things I'm not, I know I'm not supposed to do, well, that's between him and God. I might even warn him if the Lord 
gives me that opportunity and allows me, but I'm not going to be his judge, but I know that I have to live in good conscience towards the Lord for myself. Verse 23, so the rumor spread among the community of believers that John wouldn't die. But that isn't what Jesus was saying at all. He was only saying, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what's that to you? What's that to you? And so, friend, that's a good question today. If somebody else is sinning, what's that to you? That's not permission for you to sin. No, it's between you and God. And when you read the Bible, and he tells you what to do. Stop being bitter. Stop being jealous. Stop being angry. Don't be bigoted. Don't be a racist. You know, don't be uh, stingy. Don't be, be crooked in your business dealings. Whatever it is he tells you to do, well, that's between you and God, and you're responsible to do what he tells you to do. Verse 24, this disciple, you know, he's talking about himself, finishing up the chapter here, finishing up the book of John. He says, this disciple, meaning himself, is the one who testifies to these events and has recorded them here. And so all the book of John, from John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. Then he talks about the ministry of John the Baptist. And he talks about all the miracles of Jesus. He says all of these things, he says, I'm an eyewitness. I testify to these events and I've recorded them here. And we know that his account of these things is accurate. And he says, Jesus also did many other things, and many other miracles, many other exploits. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. And friend, that's the end of the book of John. I love that book, but it's not the end of the life of Jesus. Amen. If all the things that he did during his three years of ministry could be written down, the whole world couldn't hold the books written about the miracles that could have been written about the miracles of Jesus. And friend, today, Jesus is still doing miracles. And if you've got faith and you have a faith like a little child, you can receive miracles and, and know him today in your life. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening along with you. God, God willing, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, bye-bye.